Hello and welcome to Showcase, where fashion, forests and fluttering is supposed to save our species. Here, here and only here. Designer Stella McCartney says the fashion industry can save the planet. We ask if vertical vegetation is the architecture of the future. We'll take you to a place where art meets happiness, or so they say. Jonathan Safran Foer is not just a best-selling author anymore. His memoir, We Are the Weather, has inspired its very own fashion line. Designer Stella McCartney was inspired by the book's take on climate change that she came up with a capsule collection of organic cotton clothes. Adorned with sun motifs, these clothes are printed with poems written by Foa in his handwriting. On the brand's website, it says that the collection cares for the planet and encourages everybody to live differently. And McCartney says fashion can gently open people's eyes to the possibility of change. Well, let's examine that theory by talking to critic Alex Preston. Hi, Alex. So, you wrote a review about this book and you said that it's a life-changing book and you loved it to bits. Tell me what you think about this collection now. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fascinating that it's obviously uh, something which has used the book as a launch pad to try and get more people out there to uh, to embrace its message. Um, you know, it is a life changing book. It's a book that has a strong message about how we can all change. And I think the more ways that people engage with it, the better. OK, so what would you say the message of the book is? It's, it's, if you like, it's an old-fashioned polemic. It's a, a book which seeks to persuade the audience, the readership, of its principal message, which is that we should all be eating much less meat. Uh, Saffron Foer suggests that uh, we only, uh, we no meat at all before dinner time, um, and that this is really one of the, the only ways that we can reverse the, the climate crisis. And I think, you know, I think it's quite important that it, it's obvious on and given our own family's history uh, of engaging with uh, with ethical eating. Mm -hmm. Okay, so buying a five hundred dollar shirt, dry clean only. How do I contribute to this idea advocated in the book? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously uh, you know the fashion industry has its own ridiculousnesses, <laughs> um, and uh, you know uh, I think that we all need to consume less, but but at the same time. I think in in the climate discussion generally, I think we're far too often looking for ways of blaming people or of uh, 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 of if you like um, advertising our own virtuousness rather than taking something like this, which I think is genuinely a good a good thing. It's going to get more people talking about the book. It's going to get more people reading the book. Going to get more people thinking about some of the issues it brings up. Uh, yes, I personally am not going to be purchasing any of the clothes from the collection because I'm a poverty-stricken author, um, but I'm delighted that maybe some people will. Okay, but I mean, as someone who is uh, so fascinated by this book, are you sort of um, afraid of the dangers of greenwashing that is certainly taking place in the fashion world at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a very, very good question. And it's something that I've thought a great deal about. I think that, you know, if you look across the corporate world at the moment, not not just in fashion, but everyone is suddenly full of their own uh, kind of Greta Thunberg inspired um, uh, evangelism for their own, um, uh, you know, why their own company is so much better when it comes to, 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 to ESG, as they call it, environmental, social, uh, responsible. I, I, my view on it is, is really that everyone who isn't actively against us at this point has to be viewed as being with us. And so, yes, I think there is greenwashing going on, but I would much rather people were talking about these things than denying them. Okay, well, unfortunately, this is all the time we have. Alex Preston, thank you so much for weighing in. Thank you.
Social media has often been accused of being a source of bullying and anxiety. But a new exhibition in Hollywood aims to change that. It gives kids, both big and small, a place to touch some art, take a photo and improve their mental health. It's called Flutter and organizers say it encourages kindness and tolerance amidst a backdrop of what really looks like a huge playground. Does art have to be thought-provoking and mind-boggling all the time? Let's say for a change you'd like to forget about your worries and grab some peace of mind. So is the ethos behind Flutter experience. Touch, sit, play, interact and take endless photos. This immersive exhibition wants you to feel the joy and wonder of art and spread them on Instagram later. The point of Flutter is to create a space that counteracts some of the things that we've been seeing since smartphones and social media, anxiety and depression has skyrocketed. And there's a lot of science that says going to art museums is really good for us. So what I wanted to do was create a space that allowed people to be connected to art and for non-art people to really enjoy an art experience. So what I want people to leave is enjoying themselves, having fun, but feeling connected, connected to the art, to the artists, to themselves and to their friends. VR, projection mapping, ASMR, claimable furniture, lights, architecture and a sensory journey. Each room pushes the limits of what art could be when it's infused with technology. They were designed by 15 coveted contemporary artists. The goal? Create a space for adults that evokes their childhood nostalgia for playfulness. Andre Herrera designed the first room. It's called Untitled. He was inspired by the LA sunrise and the sunset. We were asked to uh, design a, a activation in Flutter. And uh, what we did was um, create an environment that uh, was really all about the user or the person that came and explored their own creativity within the space. Then there is Uzumaki Sipida's bathroom. It's an explosion of blue fur and rubber ducks. It ironically explores the bathroom as a safe space for daydreaming, self-care and battling depression. I think it's really uh, relevant to today. It's um, appealing to a lot of different people. I think whether you're here for Instagram or you're here for the art experience, I think it's pretty great. But the experience aims to be more than just a place for photo ops and Instagram posts. What I love about it, it's, it's experiential. It's touch, it's sight, it's sound. You're looking at things. And, and you know, that's really, whether you like it or not, it's art, so it's up to you. But it's inspirational, it makes you think. It's aspirational, it, it, it gives you ideas. And if they can do that, you know, more power to them. I love these things. Playtime aside, a portion of a $32 ticket also goes to support mental health programs in partnership with Lady Gaga's Born This Way Foundation. Egypt's King Ramses has a legacy enshrined in a colossal statue that stands 12 meters high and weighs more than 75,000 kilograms. Not the easiest thing to move around, but still, it's been relocated many times over the past 3,200 years. That journey is the subject of a documentary showing in Amman. This is the Rainbow Theatre in Amman, and the spotlight is on a film about an Egyptian pharaoh. Where Did Ramses Go is Amir Bayoumi's documentary about the statue of Ramses II. He's the famous Egyptian king who built cities, temples, and monuments. Egyptians even lovingly refer to him as the Great Ancestor, which is why Bayoumi first thought of making the movie's central focus all about logistics. He initially thought of just documenting the transportation of the statue from its location to the next location. But what was supposed to be a film about history turned into Bayoumi's personal tale of modern Egyptian politics. He decided to link the movie to his personal relationship with the statue 
and the relationship between the statue and Egypt's modern history. As of the 1952 revolution, leading up to moving the statue and all the political changes that happened in Egypt from 1952 until the statue's move. So why is a movie theater in Jordan highlighting a tale about Egypt? It's the sixth time that the Ismailia Festival has worked with the Royal Commission in Amman to introduce numerous cultures and showcase numerous countries from abroad. What is um, special or unique about this event in Amman is the selection of uh, uh, documentaries, uh, short uh, narratives, short documentaries and animation films that will be screened here in Amman. Uh, the various uh, topics that are covered in these films, which is a very great opportunity uh, for the Jordanian audience and those residing in Jordan to watch films that are um, participating at festivals abroad, uh, films that are award-winning movies and art house, let's say, or non-commercial uh, films. After a three-day screening, the event ended with a five-minute Polish animation film. And now for a quick look at some other stories from the world of the arts and culture. It's unclear whether Elton John will be able to finish his farewell tour. The 72-year-old music icon cut short a concert in Auckland, New Zealand after being stricken with a walking pneumonia. He broke down in tears after his voice gave out, forcing him to leave the stage among a roar of cheers from the supportive crowd. The farewell Yellow Brick Road Tour is scheduled to hold 300 concerts. Two stolen artifacts are on their way back to Turkey from the UK. The Turkish government says a sculpture and a sarcophagus, both dated between 3000 and 2000 BC, are the property of a local museum. The pieces were going to be auctioned off in London, and British police had to intervene when the auction house refused to stop the sale. The 10-year anniversary of Alexander McQueen's death is being remembered with an exhibit and auction in New York. Dozens of items owned by the fashion designer will be on display or up for sale. They include clothing, drawings and design patterns. McQueen took his own life in February 2010. A pizza parlor in a rundown district of Seoul has hit it big after appearing in the Academy Award winning movie Parasite. The owner of Sky Pizza says her sales have doubled and the kitchen is running out of door. Tourists are flocking to the modest 10-seater restaurant after it briefly showed up in Parasite, which won four Oscars, including Best Picture. This year, the world's first ever forest city will go up in China's Guangxi province. Designed by Italian architect Stefano Boeri, the forest will house offices, hotels, apartments, hospitals and schools all entirely covered by plants and trees. According to Boeri, this is the newest weapon in the fight against pollution. But will it work? Some experts say no. Cities cover only a fraction of the Earth's surface. Yet, they are responsible for more than 75% of the world's carbon emissions. And according to Italian architect Stefano Buri, this means that if we can solve pollution in cities, we can ultimately save the planet. It's hard to breathe in Milan, it's hard to breathe in Beijing, it's hard to breathe in Frankfurt, it's sometimes hard to breathe also in Boston. So, it's, we, have a, we have a common issue all over the world. Vertical forest is one of the, I think, most uh, important and efficient way to reintroduce nature inside the city. Which is why he designed the world's first ever forest city, to combat pollution in China. An idea he thinks will be replicated all over the world. 
But this strange botanical growth has been climbing up our concrete surfaces for years. Vertical gardens can be found all around the globe, along with vertical forests. They can be seen from Paris and Milan to Singapore and Mexico City. More and more architects are turning to this radical form of facade design as a way to combat climate change. According to the Environmental Foundation, Gronco, this lush green surface of the Santalia building in Bogota compensates for the carbon footprint of over 700 individuals, while its 3,000 square meters of vegetation provides enough oxygen supply for 3,000 people. But vertical forests don't just breathe oxygen back into our polluted cities. According to Buri and his clients, they also benefit our mental health. Le piante, eh, i fiori, le, i, i, gli uccellini che le, che le abitano, che le vivono, possono in qualche modo creare delle emozioni, anche un senso di, di relax. Working at Amazon in Seattle is literally a walk in the park. The company makes use of vertical gardens to help employees sustain a peaceful state of mind. And according to media outlet Business Insider, people working in offices surrounded by plants are 15% more productive. But there are skeptics. The American Society of Civil Engineers say a lot of the plants and trees are removed from their natural habitats and made to survive at higher altitudes temperatures and wind speeds. The more challenging their environment, the more water they need to survive. But besides their thirst, vertical gardens and forests also require an endless amount of very costly maintenance. So much so that with that same time, money and H2O, we could ultimately sustain several existing forests. And lastly, the organization says, such a hefty price makes vertical gardening a rich man's luxury, unlikely to be implemented anywhere near low-cost residential areas. So is vertical vegetation a solid solution to saving our planet, or just a gimmick to soothe our conscience? Salome Fancel, TRT World. Let's turn to Marielana Nicolopoulou now. She is a professor of sustainable architecture at the University of Kent. Hi, Marielana. Thank you so much for joining us today. So let's just redirect that question to you. Do you think it's fair to say that a vertical forest architecture is just a fashionable gimmick? It could be an interesting vision moving forward uh, for our cities. Uh, they could provide a number of advantages. So apart from the aesthetically pleasing aspect of vegetation, uh, shrubs and trees at this sort of a much grander scale um, could provide an interesting uh, way moving forward for the cities in terms of climate change and increasing resilience. So um, we could discuss the advantages of uh, vegetation at a, uh, at a larger scale effectively, which can help um, with pollution in terms of uh, uh, absorbing CO2 and uh, different of pollutants and dust, but also in terms of reducing temperatures uh, uh, and reducing the urban heat island. Effectively, we do know that um, temperatures in cities, particularly city centers, are higher than the surrounding countryside. And this is where vegetation can uh, help a lot effectively by not allowing temperatures to increase as much. So they really help with cooling our cities and uh, they provide extensive shading, mm -hmm. which can also help with cooling the buildings behind it. So it could actually be a really interesting vision for the cities. But it's very early on for this concept, right? So do we have any analysis, any sort of like statistics on this or are we just assuming these outcomes? 
Well, we, we know in terms of uh, extensive studies that have been carried out um, with uh, the effect of vegetation, and normally, obviously, um, at this scale, it's much more easily that we see them as um, vertical forests. But we know even the addition of um, um, a, a park can have, can, can have um, in, um, major impact, if we can imagine, at the surrounding area of a site. So um, if we think what the advantage of a, a plain park can be, if we multiply that the scale and bring it up vertically, it can, um, pr it, we can actually see multiplying some of these advantages. I mean, it's fair to say that it's not, it's not a panacea for the development of cities. Mm. And there are lots of issues in terms of embodied carbon and Obviously, the buildings will need different kind of um, construction and uh, much more robust, uh, almost particularly if we discuss the roots and systems that would allow the trees to flourish and survive to have the benefits that they could have. Okay. So from the embodied carbon perspective, w that this is significantly increased uh, part of the equation. So, okay, but can um, I cut you I off there and ask something? Sorry. Uh, for example, one yes. argument that is raised a lot by critics is that the cost and water needs to, to sort of like sustain one such vertical forest is actually the amount of water that is needed to sustain an existing horizontal forest. So why do we need these new concepts? Well, I, I wouldn't advocate, first of all, getting rid of horizontal forest to build vertical forest. I would imagine this is a discussion worth having where construction is to be carried out. So I don't think it's, an, um, it's a discussion that should be, uh, we should be replacing uh, horizontal forest and building vertical ones. I don't think we should be going anywhere because this would be um, a dangerous route to follow. But if we're talking about um, a city center of a, where development is actually taking place, uh, you know, in terms of replacing this uh, development with a system that can have all these added benefits, then it would be um, a discussion worth having, particularly in terms of um, uh, enabling um, sort of uh, the, the urban heat island, the temperatures to reduce, about enabling natural ventilation and cooling. One of the biggest problems, and we'll be seeing much more of this moving forward in a warming climate is particularly during the summer period. What do you do with increased temperatures? We mm -hmm. know people are um, resulting in air conditioning, which are very expensive and not just financially, but um, environmentally. Okay, and but we're getting into this vicious circle. Mm -hmm. But how, do you think it's Excuse reasonable me? to imagine the same sort of transformation happening in mega cities all around the world? Like, are we going to see all buildings I, in vegetation in five years in Europe, for example? How plausible uh, is this? Five years, I would imagine this, this scale and this uh, rapid progress would be possible. I think we've seen, uh, we've been having this debate for a long time. We've been seeing <coughs> sort of, um, you know, um, a handful of buildings, actually. So it is a very slow process. And I don't think it is viable to say that we're going to have this anytime soon. That's why I said it's an interesting vision and some individual buildings have demonstrated um, the benefits and then we'll also, uh, you know, it's worth remembering the benefits for the people that will be living into these buildings as well. We know from extensive studies that have been carried out in terms of the uh, benefits for individuals mm -hmm. for their health and well-being, both at a physical as well as psychological and mental health. And this is again where green can um, have significant advantages, mm -hmm. but it is a bit too premature to say that in the next five years we could yeah. have such construction. Okay, well, let's wait and see how many vertical forests will be around the globe in five years. Marielena Nicolopoulou, good to have you on our show today. Thank you so much. We're going to wrap up today's show with a love story. It intertwines a couple's passion for calligraphy and Arabic music which produces a dance between shape and melody. Meet Hadi Al Sadar and Hannah Hamarsheh. They didn't study art. In fact, the Palestinian couple fell in love while studying engineering at university. But their passion for Arabic calligraphy and music changed their paths. And this gallery is the result of the efforts to do something that hasn't been done before. We want to combine Hadi with Hannah, Oud with authentic Arabic calligraphy, and that is where the idea of the project started. Now, the Oud element does not show clearly in the store, but I'm sure in the future it will gradually become more visible. The gallery recently opened in the occupied West Bank city of Tulkarm. 
and to promote it, they created these videos. It is like a world by itself, not just a store that sells pieces. Her soul is in every painting. I also took her calligraphy course, which was amazing. She works with her heart and I learned a lot. I'm not that experienced in calligraphy, but I had an interest in it, so I wanted to develop my skills. But what Hamarsheh wants most is to pass on her skills to a new generation. For her, it's a way to give young people growing up in a land filled with violence a reason to hit the pause button and find some solace in a piece of paper and a little bit of ink. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel has more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Ilf Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.